Welcome to lesson four. In this lesson, we're going to talk about the chi-square test of independence. Specifically, in this lesson, we're going to look at the chi-square test theory and its assumptions. We're then going to go through an example of how to do a chi-square test. After that, we're going to go through an example of how to do a post hoc test for the chi-square test of independence so that you know exactly where differences lie. And finally, we're going to show how to visually represent the results of the chi-square test by creating clustered bar charts. In this video, we're going to talk about the theory behind the chi-square test, and we're also going to look at the assumptions of this test as well. Specifically, what we're going to do here is we're going to look at the purpose of the chi-square test of independence. Why are we even doing this test? After that, we're going to talk about the different hypotheses that you have for the chi-square test of independence. From there, we're going to talk about some of the theory, and we're going to take a look at the formulas so that we better understand the mechanics of what is going on behind the chi-square test of independence. From there, we'll go through an example of how to do the chi-square test, and we'll apply it to the formulas as well. And finally, we're going to talk about the assumptions of the chi-square test of independence. Let's talk about the purpose of the chi-square test of independence. What this test is going to do is it's going to study the relationship between two or more categorical variables. Typically, you're going to look at the relationship between two categorical variables, but you could incorporate others if you'd like. So for example, we may be looking at the relationship between customer type and whether or not someone purchased a product, for example. Now, what's going to happen here for this test is that we're going to determine if one category of a variable is more likely to be associated with the category of another variable. For example, we may find that customer type A is more likely to purchase product A than customer type B, for example, okay? Or we may find, for example, that uh, females are less likely to purchase uh, product A than males. So again, we're looking at the relationship between at least two categorical variables, and we're going to see if one category of one variable is more likely to be associated to a category of another variable. Now, when it comes to the hypotheses for the Pearson chi-square test of independence, what we have is, remember, there's always two hypotheses. We have a null hypothesis, and the null hypothesis is basically saying that the variables are not related to each other. That is, that the variables are independent. So if we're comparing males and females in terms of whether or not they're likely or not likely to purchase product A, the null hypothesis would be that there is no relationship between gender and whether they purchase this product. So males and females are equally likely to purchase this product. The alternative hypothesis or the research hypothesis is always going to state that the variables are related to each other, that the variables are associated, that the variables are not independent, but in fact they're dependent on each other. There is a relationship. So here, the alternative hypothesis might be that males are more likely to purchase product A than females. So again, that would be showing some kind of relationship here between the variables. So let's talk a little bit about the theory and the formulas behind the chi-square test of independence. So here what we're looking at is we're looking at a cross-tabulation table, and we're looking at the relationship between gender and handedness. So notice, first of all, that we have two categorical variables, and each of these two categorical variables happen to have two categories. You could have, like I said, more than two categorical variables in this test, and you can have as many categories as you wish. So here what we're seeing, for example, is that we have a total of 48 males and we have a total of 48 females, a total of 96 people in the sample. We can also see, for example, that out of the 48 males, 32 of them are right-handed. So it's about, it's two-thirds of the sample, about 67% of the sample. For 67% of the males are right-handed. Same thing for females. 67% of the females are right-handed as well. So overall, we see that about 67% of the sample happens to be right-handed, about 33% of the sample happens to be left-handed. Okay, let's take a look at a little more information. Now, the formula that is used for the chi-square test is this formula that you're seeing here. It's called the chi-square, and that's represented by the x squared. And then that's going to be equal to, this is sum, summing what was observed, that's what the O is, the actual counts that we're seeing in our sample minus what was expected. What would we expect if there was no relationship between these variables? All that is then divided by the uh, what was expected. 
We'll talk about that more in, in a little bit, but really the two main players here of this formula are the observed counts and the expected counts. Observed is, again, what we're seeing in the actual table in terms of what we collected in our sample. Expected is what we would expect if the null hypothesis was true, if there was absolutely no relationship between the two variables. This is the formula in terms of how you get your expected counts. The way you get them is you take the number of cases in each row and you multiply it by the number of cases in each column and then you divide by the total number of cases. So what we would have here, for example, is that for cell 1-1, we would have a total of 64 cases uh, for the row multiplied by 48 cases for the column. And then we divide that by our total sample, which is 96. So the expected count, what we would expect if those, there was absolutely no relationship, would be 32 people. And then you can see that information for all of the other cells as well. Now, let's plug that into the formula. If we plug that information into the formula, we'd see that the observed is what we're seeing right here in these cells minus what was expected, what we calculated in the previous uh, equation. You take that information, you square it, and then you divide by the expected count again. And then this gives you your total, and then you add that all up. Now, in this particular example, what was observed and what was expected is exactly the same. So clearly this adds up to zero, and then regardless of what else we do in the formula, it's still going to just add up to zero, meaning that there really was no relationship. We can see that there is the relationship between gender and handedness is exactly the same for both females and for males. Now, the last thing that we're going to do is we're just going to see the actual statistics themselves, and we see that the value for the Pearson chi-square test is zero, which is exactly what we calculated. Now, as it turns out, there's not just one chi-square dis distribution. There's actually a lot of different chi-square distributions. And the way you determine what chi-square distribution to use is based on degrees of freedom. This is the way degrees of freedom are calculated. You take the number of rows, minus 1, multiplied by the number of columns, minus 1. Here we have the actual numbers plugged in. You see that they add up to a value of 1, so therefore degrees of freedom is 1. That tells whatever statistical program you're using, okay, this is the value that I obtained based on my formula. This, these are the degrees of freedom that I'm using, so this is the distribution of the chi-square test that is really being assessed, and then I can get my probability value. And in this case, the probability value is a value of 1, which means that we're not going to reject the null hypothesis, okay? The, remember, our p-value or significance level, we ideally would like it to be some, a result to be statistically significant, and that probability value would be less than 0 0.05. Clearly, this probability value is much higher than that. So in this case, what we're seeing is that there is no relationship between gender and handedness. And basically what that means is handedness is equally distributed between the genders. Okay, We have the same uh, distribution for both females and males in terms of handedness. Now let's look at another possibility. Here we've changed the numbers a little bit. And we see we have a total of 32 males that are right-handed. We have 44 females that are right-handed. We see that for males, 67% uh, of males are right-handed, whereas 92% of females are right-handed. And then we see that uh, when it comes to being left-handed, a third of males are left-handed and only 8% of females are left-handed. All right, let's use those numbers and plug those in. Again, same formula. We still have to calculate the expected values. The expected values change a little bit here because we don't have the same kind of distribution that we had before. So we see, for example, that for males uh, that are right-handed, we take the number of cases in that row, which is 76, multiplied by the number of cases in that column, which is 48, and then we divide by the total number of cases, which is 96, and that gives us a value of 38. And then you see what the other values are for each one of the other cells as well. If we then calculate that information and put that into the actual chi-square formula, you see that we do not end up adding up to a total chi-square value of zero. Instead, we end up adding up to a chi-square value of 9.1. And then if we assess that information now, we see that the Pearson chi-square that was calculated by our statistical program, which within rounding error, what we found as well, 9.1, we still have one degree of freedom. Again, that's this is the way that we calculate it. But notice that what we have in terms of significance level is very low. It's less than 0 0.05. So that means that the probability of the null hypothesis being correct is really small. 
less than 0.05, less than 5%. And therefore, we reject the null hypothesis and we conclude that there is a relationship between gender and handedness. So we found support for the research hypothesis, for the alternative hypothesis. And basically what we found is that handedness is not equally distributed among the genders. We see that females are much more likely than males to be right-handed, while males are more likely than females to be left-handed. And those were the percentages that we had seen before. Okay, so that might be the way that you end up reporting these, these results. So it's not just enough to say, yes, we found a relationship between these two variables, but let's dig in a little deeper and see exactly where those, those differences lie. Females happen to be more likely to be right-handed than males, and males happen to be more likely than females to be left-handed. Now, so again, that's the way the chi-square test is, is going to work. We're looking at the relationship between two categorical variables, and then once we determine if there was or was not a relationship between those variables, if there was one, then we have to dissect it a little bit more, dig in a little deeper to find out exactly where those differences lie and, and what the relationship really is. Now, I want to point out one last thing here. Notice this um, little footnote that pops up here. Zero cells have expected counts less than five. The minimum expected count is 10. Where does that number come from? Remember the minimum expected value here was 10. That was where that number comes from, okay? Now, why am I pointing that out? That's going to be important when we look at the, our assumptions for the chi-square test of independence in a minute, okay? So again, I just wanted to point that out. We don't have any cells that have expected counts less than five. The minimum expected count was 10. That's a good thing. And uh, again, we'll talk about that when we talk about assumptions. Now, what are the assumptions of the chi-square test? There are a few of them, not very many, generally pretty simple to meet. The first is that the variable should be categorical. So we should be using this test with both either nominal or no level variable. So this is not really the type of test that you would want to use for a continuous variable. Can you use a continuous variable in this test? Yes, but you're not really maximizing what you can get out of that data. There are better tests that you can use. Another assumption for the chi-square test is that you should have a large enough sample. And that's exactly what I was getting at when we saw zero cells had, expected, had the expected count less than five. Okay, so we should have a large enough sample to do a chi-square test. Otherwise, the estimates become unstable. So where you saw that little footnote, ideally that's what you would like to see. Zero cells have expected counts less than five. As long as you have less than 20% of expected values in the cells that are less than five, you should be okay. Okay, so if you ever see that value going above 20%, you know, really uh, don't trust the results of the test. What can you do? Can you potentially increase your sample size if you can? Great. If not, the other thing that you could do is reduce the number of categories that you're comparing. So, for example, let's say one variable was uh, marital status, and we had categories of uh, people that are single, married, divorced, widowed, and separated. We could either only compare maybe the two categories that had the largest numbers, or maybe we could combine some of those categories if, if that made sense. That, that's potentially a way that you can overcome that issue. Another assumption of the chi-square test of independence is that each person was only assessed once, okay? So we're not using this test for like a, a before and after design type of situation where we're seeing change in an individual. So that's, that's not the type of test that we were, we're doing here. Everybody should only be assessed one time. Also, the levels of the variable should be mutually exclusive. So not only is a person assessed one time, but they can't fall into more than one value for a, a variable. 